Today on the B2B CRO podcast, I was joined by Ben LeBay from leading B2B CRO agency Spiro. Uh, we had a great chat. We talked all things um, strategic CRO, um, how to build a culture of experimentation within B2B organizations and why you do not need a ton of traffic to have experimentation success. So uh, today I am absolutely delighted to be joined by Ben LeBay, who is the Managing Director at Spiro, um, specialist um, CRO agency, it's so hot right now. Um, ben, you've got um, a very eclectic background and I think it's really exciting that you're in CRO and your background is as a research scientist than you get the data and the statistics and all that side of things, and you're bringing that into the marketing world. What decided to get you into, um, you know, digital marketing in the first place with that kind of like data science background? Yeah, hi, hi Christy. Glad to be here. Uh, I came you know, in, in, here in Austin. I knew a guy, a family friend that was running this agency, this kind of marketing agency doing A-B testing and such. And um, we hung out for, you know, a lot and we chatted. I was working for the university at the time doing research, but also, um, uh, you know, serendipitously looking for a transition. Uh, I was offered a couple other jobs that would have kept me in the academic space or in the research space, uh, but decided to uh, kind of take a leap of faith and start working with this guy, this gentleman, uh, Pep Laya, who was the founder of, of the agency of CXL, of Winter. Kind of a serial um, uh, startup guy, uh, entrepreneur. So I, I took a leap of faith, went to work with him. Really, kind of enjoyed it. The skills that I learned in academia translated really well in terms of, as you mentioned, sit stats, but more notably, I guess, research science, like how to think about data, how to think about what to do with it, what not to do with it, and things like that. Um, and then just also skill sets of technical writing, um, presentation, uh, leading teams, leading initiatives. Um, so that just kind of put me down in the road of um, where I'm now in terms of like, you know, being a CEO and kind of running, running, yeah. running the agency. Yeah. So I guess um, you are one of those unique people that combines all the academic skill with those good people and interpersonal skills if you're able to to run a team and you know like you say build out the agency but also um have all of that academia behind you um yeah yeah i think i was a bit of an odd duck in academia i was there i didn't fit really well in terms of like the precision and the attention to detail that was needed to be there but it definitely um elevated my knowledge of that kind of uh, capability, that, that the ability mm. to have so much precision in the work that, that I was doing. And I was working for like, a, like literally almost doing like library science, like data conservation work. And it required a lot of attention to detail and stuff. And then I was always wanting to kind of do, I don't know, some different stuff. And so I, I was a bit of an odd duck there. And then, and then coming over into to marketing, I was suddenly, I was the precision guy. <laughs> <'Cause everyone laughs> yeah. else was, so much more loosey goosey on all of the work that they were doing with data. Uh, mm -hmm. And so it was a, that was a little bit better place for me to be on that side. Yeah. Of the yeah. yeah, that makes sense. And like you say, um, you know, Spiro is part of um, CXL who have a great, um, her I mean, not a, you know, a long, long heritage because CRO hasn't really been, you know, I suppose a hot topic you know, forever in marketing. Um, but the business was founded in 2011 and then you rebranded as Spiro in 2020. Um, can you tell us a little bit about like your mission and the, the problem that you're trying to solve for businesses? Yeah, definitely. So back in, I don't know, the early teens, 2015, especially 16, that's when the CRO world was sort of taking off. I think Pep did a good job in terms of the content side of things and getting that uh, awareness out of this work and of this field of like kind of the behavioral psychology aspects of it, the data aspects of it and everything and writing a bunch on it. At that time, I think CRO was in the beginning. Um, 
A-B testing was a little bit difficult. So you went to agencies to do that. Uh, and, and it was a good place to be. I think as we're evolving now, uh, we, we're trying to go up market, uh, but we're trying to solve problems that are more programmatic. So not running an A-B test, but more so um, running a, an A-B testing program, running experimentation as a function within an organization rather than yeah. just as kind of this service that you do a little bit of. So the mission of, of Spiro um, is to use experimentation as a superior way to grow a business. Uh, and through digital experiences is sort of our sweet spot. Uh, but we fundamentally believe that experimentation is a methodology to grow. It allows for adaptation. It allows for learning at scale. It also allows like bottom up um, understanding as opposed to like top down um, authorita authoritarian kind of leadership of like running an organization. You, you Experimentation is a tool that marketers and people on the ground with customers can use to make decisions on their own and, yeah. and have their own accountability systems. So our mission is very much like using experimentation as a way to grow a uh, business. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I think you're, you know, it, it's that ability to to fail isn't it that's so important within cultures and it's you know the the culture of experimentation is is giving people permission to do that but that's when the greatest innovations happen and and, and so often in business we are we are a bit paralyzed paralyzed certainly at, at those lower levels well we'd rather do nothing than make the wrong decision but then creating a culture that encourages you know experiment sometimes you'll win sometimes you won't um, I think is really powerful. And yeah, of course, like nowhere more powerful than in the digital marketing world. Um, I, I, spent, I spent a lot of time looking at, obviously we invited you because we thought, you know, you're really interesting. You're going to add a lot of value to um, the listeners of the, the Webio podcast. Um, but, but when we chatted and when I looked more into what Spiro do, one of the things that really interested me was this we have this widely held view or certainly i think i probably have a, and many of our customers have that cro conversion rate optimization um only happens once a buyer gets to the website it's like everything else is digital advertising and you know that's our media and that's what we're focused on doing over there and conversion rate optimization only happens when we're trying to when when someone's arrived at the site and it's only on the website i think your view at, at spira is a little bit different you take a more of a holistic view um and refer to it as kind of um strategic conversion rate optimization where you're taking into account everything from how you're optimizing your C, uh, seo to the content you're creating can you tell us a little bit more about that approach yeah, that that viewpoint is a strategic viewpoint itself. I mean, I think that for better or for worse, we're, we we try to be strategic with CRO. I don't think it has to be strategic. It can be tactical. You can. I know a, a, a good friend, um, Rishi, who's on LinkedIn and quite quite uh, um, popular or not popular. He he posts a bunch. He's popular there as well. He focuses only on uh, product detail pages. That's it. He only does CRO for product detail pages. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so I, I think that that CRO can be a niche. It, 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 it kind of was born from this world of, OK, we're buying a bunch of traffic and we're only converting one percent of them. Let's do better. And so how can we do that? I think that's where it was born. I think that's a good application of it, um, but it can go further. And that's, you know, again, for better or for worse, Spiro has decided to go further according to that mission of using experimentation to grow a business well it can also be used to test things that are a lot more strategic like you mentioned mm -hmm. like seo test testing headline testing acquisition mm -hmm. testing uh just layering in hypotheses uh that are customer centric uh in, term, in terms of all the channels and functions that are happening within an organization so product of course um playing with channels uh and, and just doing all sorts of a little bit more disruptive less iterative types of things. So traditionally, CRO is, is focused on optimization. So iter you know, iteration, small things, squeeze, squeezing more juice out of that lemon. But it can also be helpful as a framework to think larger, new products, yeah. 
whole new channels, new pricing models, new business models, and things like that. So uh, that's where we're, you know, that's where we're looking to take it. Our origin is like landing page optimization, but where we're going from there, we're working with acquisition and demand teams a lot right now with acquisition research and uh, ICP research, win loss analysis, helping B2B um, organizations sort of understand what pipelines of revenue that they should be playing with, or they should looking look to get more efficient and things like that. I think that there's a lot of, um, a lot of work that experimentation can do in, in these types of problems that, that are not that traditional, let's just move the page around and see what works on to get more people to fill out this form or to purchase this product. Uh, it can go a lot bigger than that. Yeah, and I think the approach that you've just just described, it's so relevant for that B2B buyer journey because, of course, making a, a small change on a product page can be really powerful if you're an e-commerce business. But if you are a B2B organization with a, a decision-making unit that includes you know, up to 10 different people who all have different needs and wants, then... Um, you do have to really think about your messaging um, it, on a bigger basis. And also, you know, a lot of B2B businesses, and I really want to talk, touch on this in more detail, hopefully later, a lot of B2B businesses don't have those um, volumes of traffic that like a Nike might have where you can make the tiniest adjustment and that can give you a big swing in conversion. Like, you know, they do have to make, bigger strategic plays to, to make a difference. So yeah, I can imagine that that approach has to be the right way to go down for B2B. Yeah, and it sounds pretty broad, you know, be more disruptive, test on bigger things. Like, you know, you might say like, okay, well, how do we do that? I, and tactically it starts with getting close to the customer. Mm -hmm. uh, so doing that kind of product discovery uh, that that customer research that helps you think about like solid hypotheses and helps you find customer problems that are worth solving that when you do put out a solution, you're going to have measurable, you know, you're going to have some metrics to help you understand if you put out the right thing or not uh, and help you even find opportunities for new types of maybe adjacent products or ad adjacent types of uh, customer sets that that are out there that you're not targeting right now with your messaging. So I think it fundamentally we're talking about like uh, you know product management one on one type of work where you're getting close to the customer, you're identifying the problems, and you're setting up interventions to see if you're solving those things well. Uh, and then that kind of goal tree maps its way up to to revenue, and and, and it, it could that revenue that the 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 KPIs can be kind of seen within an A-B test, but it could also just be seen within analytics on cha in, in changing behaviors. It could be seen in uh, customer survey responses and in terms of like a different messaging application and what your I a set of ICPs respond, how a set of ICPs respond to that messaging a little bit differently. Uh, so your yeah. intervention doesn't have to be an A-B test. Uh, it can be a user test. It can be a survey. Um, it can be just a new landing page to a new channel. Uh, that is an intervention. That is an experiment. Um, uh, you know, uh, you know, an in-app, uh, campaign that wasn't there before, but is now you can have a hypothesis with it. You can have a set of metrics associated with it, and you can come out to a conclusion with the data that you collect from it. So it doesn't have to be an AB test. Um, you can do a lot of different types of interventions. The tactical way to get quote unquote strategic with it is start with the customer, get close to the customer, wh whatever your touch point is, is it, is it, product A versus product B? Is it channel A versus channel B? Is it is it onboarding? Is it retention? Is it monetization? Whatever touch point you own, start asking your customer a lot of questions about it. Think of sets of interventions that you can do to, to and, and then rank those before you do them. You know, do, do two weeks sprints, month sprints, whatever. How much potential revenue are in them? Uh, and these are quote unquote experiments. Um, yeah. And then go for the big ones. Yeah. Yeah. So I've just written down loads of notes here that I've got further questions to ask you about. So um, the first point you mentioned, which I wholeheartedly agree with is, you know, you've got to get close to your customer. You've got to understand your customer, do the customer interviews to really build a picture of, you know, what you should be experimenting with. Um, that can be quite hard for marketers 
sometimes. Yeah, we overthink it. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, also, it, it's it's getting that it's you know culturally um, it depends on the organisation, but sometimes they'll have to go through sales to get that. They won't have the direct FaceTime with the customer or, um, you know, perhaps it's not something that, that they have done before. Um, so I think that is like, for me, it's like you cannot skip that step. Otherwise, you're just, you know, you're plucking idea, ideas out of out of nowhere. You guys, you've created a, a blueprint to help organisations um, build out this culture of experimentation. So do you cover that in there? Like, how do you get the good customer insight from talking to customers? Who does the customer interviews? Does marketing have to do it directly? Do we pull it in from other areas? Like, how does that happen? Yeah, I mean, what you're talking about there is um, there's different levels of, you know, how to do customer interviews. And you can sure. think too much about it. And if you've got a UX department and, and you're a big enterprise, you're no doubt thinking way too much about it. Uh, the key is to get to to get it and and become have it to become a little bit more of your muscle memory. So like do it once, do it twice, mm -hmm. playbook it, make it easy, make it seamless, uh, get your data, uh, and don't don't settle for you know gatekeepers around your organization. Oh, you got to go talk to sales, and they won't let me survey such and such. Okay, well, who can I survey? Can I can I talk to this just this person? Can I stand up a just a simple, you know, survey right after my form submit that asked what almost held you back from submitting this form? Uh, don't you don't that's after the conversion you sent the sales anyway. There's no friction there. Um, you know, there are playbooks that we have as an agency. All agency has SOPs and playbooks and stuff like that. But there are playbooks that we have to make it seamless and to spell it out and a bit of a recipe on how to do it and how to pivot accordingly. We've got ones that specialize in e-commerce versus kind of B2B. I, to tell you the story, like we, we last year we started doing a type of service that we call continuous research and it's focused on customer interviews. Um, in the first month, it takes a little while of like back and forth, like we get to know the client and like, who's your ICP and how, what do you, what's the name, what are your, what's your language, what's, how do we get a hold of them? We go through that, all those, that hard situation, the logistics to be able to talk to customers. Um, and we usually talk to like five customers, let's mm -hmm. say within month one. But then what we do is just talk to one a month, that's it. Uh, and then we come up with a set of insights um, and we streamline it so much that it's a no brainer just to do it. And it goes to a, a, a product owner um, for that, who that, whom, for whom that customer is kind of relevant to, right? Uh, the insights go to them and it keeps them sort of on the pulse of, of what's going on with their customer, how to think about it. We often tweak the, the script and the, the, the scenario according to like how that maps back up to like the OKRs for that quarter uh you know and what they're building and, and some question sets that might might change but just doing that talking to one customer a month yeah. um is insanely valuable like a qualitative mm -hmm. moderated user interview of like how this customer is is going through the gauntlet your gauntlet of you know the tripwires and all the whether it's onboarding or usage of a product or or purchasing a purchasing a, um, a product or something like that uh, that's amazing to do. You, you combine that with a little light analytics um, analysis of that same problem set, and you, you've got magic. I mean, you're going to come out of with that data with a ton of experiments on top of it. Yeah. Okay. Can we implement that? Can we solve for that? Can we do that? And and you're just going to go up into the right of of your product development work. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I know that that makes sense. And and you mentioned about obviously. Um, creating these interventions and then starting to to measure success um would you be comfortable working with like so let's let's say we start with a set of benchmarks like we know that this journey or this particular type of visitor converts at this level to demo request and then making those changes, running those experiments, and then using 
the increases in conversion or whatever it is you decide to measure as an uplift against that benchmark if we can't do A-B testing? Or is that um, not quite, I understand it's not the same time period, but how does that work in terms of like statistical significance? Yeah, so you're looking to, it's more of a longitudinal study. So, you you know, a month of, uh, say you've got a month of um, MQLs through closed one and you've got a hundred of them a month, right? That's mm-hmm. not enough to A-B test. Uh, you know, I just did a crazy experiment with, and it was an A-B test, but you could imagine it really easily is not as one where there's two ways with this website to engage um, or sort of to go forward. The one is talk to a salesperson to get a quote. And the second one is a a self-guided interactive demo. Both of them are analogously gated. The demo is less committal because I'm not going to talk to a salesperson. Um, But those demo leads, according to the sales team, are less valuable because they're a bunch of tire kickers. Um, And so... What we did as an experiment, A-B test, was just remove the interactive demo wholesale, right? And what we saw was the data was quite flat. Um, And you could do this without an A-B test in just month one, month two, and see what happens. But the data was quite flat. And we ended up keeping the demo because the hypothesis there is that there's like uh, a set amount of, of people that are interacting a little bit more with the product. They have a deeper level of engagement with that interactive demo, even though that the leads aren't, aren't so great. But in the A-B test, we measured, in, in this case, we measured that it was flat and lead quality didn't change. So we kept the demo, but that might be, that, that's a, you know, N of one in terms of this product and this industry, et cetera. Yeah. Um, but you can imagine that just being like, hey, for this month, we're gonna just remove this interactive demo thing that we built and then see what happens to our pipeline. Um, you know, if you have only two or three a, a month, you know, yeah, you, that, you're not going to learn from that. But, no, you know, if you have 100 a month, you're going to you're going to learn. Yeah. You're going to do some 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 good things there. Yeah. And um, like thinking about that, then um, you made a really good point that, you know, it would have been really easy for um, the team to go, oh, do you know what? The results are flat, as in we're getting no like the, the MQLs are the same or do you know what they're less because we've taken out that interactive demo but the fact that uh, you took it all the way through to revenue I think is really important and I I still see that as an education piece for marketers because um, the best businesses the marketers are getting measured all the way to revenue but there are many many organizations where they just stop at an MQL and it's like well I, I don't know what happens beyond there um, so taking the results of your experiment right the way through to revenue is so important because if, for example, removing the demo request didn't increase leads, but it increased conversion to sale, then you've saved a ton of your salespeople's time and you've made more money. So, um, yeah, I think it's it's great that you're really encouraging um, your clients to take it all the way through. Mm. Um so that I mean, and it, that, that sound that is definitely uh, something that's going to make a big swing in or deliver a big swing in results if it is going to work. Um, I picked up this phrase from the website when I was obviously having a look at look at you guys um, last week, and you talk about strategic experimentation or strategic um, conversion rate optimization. And one of the statements you make um, is you won't find any button color tests here. And it it made me laugh, um, partly because I think, you know, having been through, um, you know, discussing A-B testing solutions with teams that I've worked with previously in the organization, everyone is like, yeah, 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 like we're going to do some A-B testing. But sometimes that is the thing that they think they they, they decide they're going to test because you're like, well, right, okay, fine, we'll buy the solution, but why are you going to test? Mm. Um, you know, so um, can you um, can you give us a bit more insight into that? Is it does it just still come back to customer interviews, getting the data, getting the insight to help you to make those decisions? Yeah, I think uh, your your the last point of your question there is is definitely a part of it. Like, you know, changing the color of the button is not very 
customer centric or, you know, is it, it's not really asking like, what is the problem of the customer? Yeah. And, you know, pretty much guarantee that the color of the button's not the problem. And so there's a, yeah. Yeah. you know, that type of testing is, yeah, it loses the, loses sight of the customer. And so I think that's kind of why we have fun with it. And we, we mention it. It also, I mean, I think that there are organizations that can do that more iterative, like tiny element type of testing. It's, it's those types of organizations have the data and the teams to not need to hire an agency. Right. So, um, and, and those, those types of organizations are just, those are like your Nike and your, those are few and far between. I mean, you, you just, they don't, um, you know, that that's not who the majority of us are. So we need to get to, to measure thing, measure things in our interventions, we have to get really close to the customer because those problems that we find or the opportunities that we sort of discover through getting close to the customer, uh, those are going to be the ones where we stand up interventions and get something that's measurable out of it. Otherwise, you know, moving social proof from one section of the page to another section of the page, um, you know, rearranging the chairs on, you know, it's not going to, it's just not going to work uh, very, very well. Um, so yeah, the, the the last part of your question nails it. Being being close to the customer uh, yeah. is what that's all about. Yeah, and I think um, you know partly because we don't have you know tons and tons of visitor um, traffic. Um, I guess it does mean that we are a bit freer to test more than one thing at the same time and combinations of of elements that are gonna I suppose appeal to a customer like you might go right okay well we've learned this from an interview so the changes that we're gonna make are you know we're going to adjust the messaging on the subhead and we're gonna adjust that when we talk about these specific products and we know that this product here is a really big in for this type of customer so we're gonna bring that to the forefront and, and your cut and customers are comfortable with doing two or three things at the same time because you just want to see an impact. Yeah, it's good to be radical uh, sometimes and shake up the boat. And I will say that, you know, what B2B, it, what it, where it lacks in volumes, it gains in the, how do I put this? The ability to make changes and really measure the effect of, um, uh, you know, like behavioral psychology. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I, I think I don't see it as much in <laughs> in e-commerce, the ability to make small changes and see massive like 10 percent changes in behavior pretty readily. I, and I do see that in, in B2B because I think filling out a form and providing that PII data uh, and, and knowing you're going to potentially going to be talking to a salesperson, there's just a lot of behavioral psychology in that little that little that yeah. transaction, it's not that much. You're not giving away money. You don't have this massive fear of loss, <coughs> loss only of, about potential time in the future. And so you, you can, ch you know, again, changes a button color. I, I'm not a fan of playing around with a ton of social proof. A little bit's good, but, but more so changing the way someone navigates through the site is, is yeah. what all B2B marketers should be thinking about. Yeah. Um, what types of product pages and landing pages, how radically simple or more complex those those pages can be. Um, we've been doing a lot of testing uh, where we take longer either feature or product or landing pages just generally that have kind of a story arc in them and everything. And we just and for first time visitors, we uh, right at the fold, there's a button that says see more that then um, opens up all of the rest of the page. But by default, it's just only above the fold. It's super simple, one action to take. Um, yeah. So that's been a fun set of testing that we've been doing a lot with B2B that just, just radically simplifies and radically adds clarity for the desired one next action that we want someone to take. And so that type of testing, even with, a, you know, a, you know, a hundred, few hundred transactions or, or, you know, form conversions a month, you can test that and get stats. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, yeah. definitely. And, uh, you know, the B2B purchase is quite an emotional purchase. And, you know, we don't, um, yeah, there's definitely way more emotion 
attached to buying a piece of software than there is to buying, I don't know, let's say a TV or a pair of shoes. Like, you know, there's like, it can have a massive impact on your career if you make the wrong decision from a, from a B2B perspective. So even submitting that, that demo request is like, right, okay, well, I've done that. So I'm now opening myself up to someone reaching out to me, taking up my time, needing to have conversations, needing to do discovery calls. So yeah, it's just how are you supporting what that buyer is going through all the way through to the journey towards conversion? Because you also know that they've probably done, you know, up 20, 30, 40 different touch points before they've got to that step. Some of them on your website, perhaps some of them, some of them not. Um, but what you said earlier, which I loved was that, you know, we can get to results fast. And you mentioned, you know, really looking at attribution differently. Um, is that something that you're working a lot with clients on? Because, you know, obviously, we all know digital advertising or your SEO, or something's got to drive that potential buyer to the website. But the CRO itself is incredibly valuable. And, you know, has brought in reven revenue to the organization. So how do you how do you manage the attribution then from that side of it? Yeah, I think I think I think about and in, in, in the B2B programs that we work with, we think about attribution, not from the standpoint of, you know, sticking it to what channel brought them in, but rather putting them into buckets of either, in, you know, in, intent or some kind of like audience mm -hmm. uh, character, if you will. Uh, and so, you know, if you've got a suite of products, they're interested in this product and they're, they're, they're maybe this role at that stage of intent. And so that's the type of attribution that we're more so interested in playing around with, because then we can remarket and personalize accordingly. Um, and, you know, so it's not really like they came in via th this set of ads or that set of ads. That's not usually the problems that we're playing with that could no. go into the model in a way of like, we could be only asking the question within that space of, um, of like just this SCM traffic that's coming in. And then let's kind of parse it up according to industry size or whatever other kind of characteristic. Um, but what we're looking to do is, and, and where you can have success in testing, by the way, is start to characterize those different levels of intent and those parameters of the audience, attribute like the, the intent level, the intent, uh, you know, the, the, the audience level, the role, et cetera, ask mm -hmm. questions before you get them to provide you an email, get them to choose their own journey through the site. Uh, and then you're collecting that zero party data all along, and then you can kind of retarget um, later on if you do get some authentication. Uh, if not, you can cook him and see what see what happens there. Um, but it, so that's that's what we play around a lot with, and that's how I think about the attribution, which is a little bit different than like thinking about like first touch, last touch kind of yeah. problem. We don't yeah. we don't typically deal with that. Yeah. Well, well, no, I mean, and I think in B two B. It's so difficult to do that anyway, because it's a journey and there are, you know, there are so many touch points. Um, yes, there might have been one thing that got them there. There might have been one thing that tipped them over the edge. But in the meantime, so I think what you've just said is you measure how far you can get them along on their journey, like to what level of qualification you can get that. MQL um, with the, um, the CRO efforts. And yeah, I think as a goal, that completely makes sense because um, it's just, you know, every time you're iterating and experimenting, hopefully you're getting more of them further on in the journey. I would, I would add on to that. Uh, the, the way that I view it, the language that I use is sort of understanding pipeline value. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. You can attribute, yeah. if we use that word, um, attribute, pipeline value to different channels and then different uh, sort of characteristics of those channels. And so say that you are bringing in LinkedIn traffic and half that LinkedIn traffic goes to a sales quote request, sales form like quote request, and half of it goes to an interactive demo. You can, you know, over time, you can um, attribute the value of those two different pipelines per that one channel. Right. Yeah. So you can understand that everybody that fills in a pi price quote from LinkedIn is worth 
you know, that form fill, that MQL is worth a hundred dollars and the demo is worth $50. Yeah. And so you can then create hypotheses of if we were to double X, it would be worth that amount. If we were to, to, to shift this pipeline like this, it would be worth Y amount. So, so that's kind of the modeling, um, to, to use a fancy word for not a fancy process. I mean, it's all spreadsheet work for how you can start to orchestrate like hypotheses and these quote unquote experiments accordingly, right? So how much money is flowing through, how do you attribute that money to different pipelines? And then how do you kind of play around with those flows uh, and flow them differently? Make them more, make your efficient ones even more efficient. Yeah. Uh, you know, take your ones that aren't really efficient and and do something, do some kind of radical learning experiment with it and flow it, you know, have it flow through a different way, that, that, those kind of things. Yeah. 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 And I'm relieved that you said it, it a lot of it happens in spreadsheets because that's um that's very close to my heart. We do we do so much. Um, you know, that that's how you can really, really get into the detail, isn't it? So yeah, um, it's important. Um, I know that after our podcast today, there will be um lots of our listeners perhaps looking to reach out to Spiro. So I'm going to ask you at the end um, how they would do that, Ben. But um, before um, we wrap up, I'm sorry, I'm going to, but I would like you to come back again at some point because I think we could talk for longer. Um, could you um, walk us through one of, I mean, you've probably got many, but one of the B2B success stories that you are particularly proud of? Yeah, I think that... Um... Uh, there's a few of them that, that I, I could draw upon, but but the the one that I'm most kind of proud of and that I do a ton of work with is this, this company called ADP. Uh, it's this payroll HR yeah, yeah. Uh, organization, and I've been doing a lot of work there for a long time. Um, and the work there is is quite gratifying, mainly because of the team and just a wonderful team to to work with, and they're doing some really amazing things. Um, but it really sits at the heart of these questions of sales-led growth compared to product-led growth. And mm -hmm. ADP is a very sales-led driven organization. And the successes that we've had in terms of, um, you know, getting, building demos and, and testing those is, is where I've gotten the, the bi biggest uh, success, I believe. Um, you know, we've got, we've had a, a lot of success with progressive exposure of question sets. And uh, if you call them like wizards or, or like choose your journey types of, uh, yeah. mechanisms and things like that you know that's the arena of testing and the work that, that we're doing where, where we're getting the, the most dividends um but it's really i, I think where my my personal success and, and and learning it has to do with you know playing around with sales-led versus product-led growth models and and what's working there um and and how that uh what there's because there's massive trade-offs um mm -hmm. it's like trading off uh a conversion for a subs for a subscription revenue in e in, in e-commerce, right? It's like yeah, yeah. you have to do some data science to figure out if it's worth it. And um, I think the the you know that's the arena where I've, I've had the most success and most learnings personally. Oh, I might have I might have a potential lead for you then. Um, I know um, one of the one of my very good friends, who's um, CMO. At, um, a SaaS company, they are just, they are bit, have been completely sales led and are looking to go more product led. And it, it's, it's hard because yeah, it's a it's yeah. cultural change. Um, but great that you've had that, the business buy in to be able to do that and, you know, um, experiment, I suppose. Um, yeah, it, I, I will, I will pass their details your way. But um, in terms of, uh, potential customers reaching out to Spiro, how, how is the best way that, what's the best way that they do that, Ben? Yeah, I'm, I'm really active on LinkedIn. I publish a, a ton there. I, I put out a lot of my thinking and, 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 and just, just kind of almost like day-to-day -day ramblings on LinkedIn. So you can reach out to me there, connect with me on LinkedIn, Ben at Spiro.com otherwise, or the website Spiro.com, but, but Ben at Spiro.com and you can email me as well. So yeah. Perfect. Thank you. And I can, uh, I can um, advocate. It's, it's definitely worth giving you um, a follow on LinkedIn. I, I've found um, everything that I've read of yours so far fascinating. So thank you. And thank you for coming on today. Yeah, um, of course. Really, this really is... great to speak to you. 
this topic is near and dear, but I live it every day. I love to, I can ramble on forever on a lot of this. So yeah.